Um, but basically, right. Um, but basically writing news releases for new products releases for Ford Motor Company and the glass division. I was bored to death um, and still had that passion to sort of pursue TV writing based on my experience in college. And I applied to a lot of the programs that I think still exist today, uh, um, Warner Brothers and whatever was around at that time, Fox, Disney. I was just trying to figure out how to get, into, get to back to LA. And then I ended up getting married and um, six years later sort of had the conversation uh, with my husband, sort of what do you wanna do if you're, what was your dream job? And I said, well, I always thought I would be going to Los Angeles and working on, you know, as a TV writer, but you know, whatever, we're married now. So that dream's dead. But he's like, I kinda wanna go to LA too because he's from Chicago. And so um, my way to do it was just to apply to grad school. And so I applied to NYU, USC and UCLA and got into just USC. And so I took that as a sign that that's where I'm supposed to be. And we packed up and moved to LA. And that's how I, that was sort of the beginning of transitioning um, into this career now. And so it was a two year program at USC, graduate screenwriting program. And it really just gave me a way to sort of transition, get to LA. Um, it was harder to stay on somebody's couch when you have a husband in tow, you can't just sort of hang out. Um, and so we came here together and I finished the program. And while I was there, I was able to intern for um, a woman named Yvette Lee Bowser who had created Living Single and had another show on the air at the time called For Your Love for Warner Brothers. And when you're in school, you get all of these sort of um, notices for internships. Do you wanna work, work for free basically and get class credit? And so um, I was able to sort of meet Yvette and um, just talk to her on the phone because she was getting an award at, it was the Organization of Black Screenwriters, which I don't even think exists anymore. And I had seen it in the trades that she was going to be getting an award with three or four other people. And I thought, wow, I had read about this woman. I really would just like to meet her. But I remember not having the money, the tickets, it was like a banquet with food and it was a big to do and it was $60. And I remember thinking, I don't have $60. So my goal was to sneak in and meet her. And then when I got there, I chickened out. I was like, I can't, I can't sneak in. And so I wrote a check that I knew it was gonna bounce, but I needed to get in. And I sat there and so many people wanted to talk to her at the time, actors, everybody surrounded her at the end. But eventually I was able to meet her, make my spiel about who I was. And I was very conscious of not asking her for anything because I felt like she was surrounded by people who wanted something from her. So she just sort of said, um, you know, call my office and talk to my assistant. So cut to me calling her assistant and she did take the call finally. And I was able to tell her about those internships that USC was offering for free for credit. Um, and she said, well, if you're in one of them happened to be a Warner Brothers show, just coincidentally, and she said, well, if you want to um, have that meeting, why don't you come over and talk to me because my bungalow is on the lot right across the way. And so I did and we connected and it turned out we were in the same sorority and she thought, I guess she realized I wasn't crazy. And so in that meeting, she said, if you would like to do your internship here on this show, since you want to do half hour TV writing at the time, then you're welcome to. And that was it. That was the beginning of everything for me. And so I basically spent those two years in grad school also interning for her. And when I came out, she was able to um, the Warner Brothers workshop. I applied to the Warner Brothers workshop again with a script. And because she was a Warner Brothers show, she was able to, once I completed the workshop, pull me out of the workshop and then put me on staff. And so that was sort of the beginning of how I um got from Northwestern <laughs> um, to my first job. And she gave me my first job and we're still uh, friends to this day and have developed together. Um, but she gave me the first and then it was, it was on and popping from there. <laughs> so you would recommend uh, even unpaid internships, it sounds like. Yes, if you're able to, and I know so many people just aren't in the position to take unpaid internships because you got bills to pay. And, you know, I was fortunate that I had a husband who was, he was just starting out, so he didn't have a lot of money either. He was a lawyer and he had just taken the bar. But if you can afford to do so um, and figure out a way to maybe work and make money in a different way, definitely valuable for me. 
for everybody, I would think. Just getting as close to the job that you want as you can, whatever that means for you, you know, being a PA, because there was a lot of internships that were in development offices, working with executives, doing, tele, doing feature coverage of scripts. And that would have been great experience, but I wanted to do TV. So getting as close as I could to a TV writer's room and TV writers, having that kind of internship made all the difference for me. Can you talk a little bit about the, the process with writers? Is it, say you had the internship, but then a lot of people say they start as a um, assistant in the writer's room. Can you just talk about that process a little bit? Yes, um, writer's assistant jobs are um, coveted and very difficult and very demanding. Um, I think a lot of writer's assistants get there in different ways, but a lot of them will start off as a PA on a TV show or they will be a showrunner's assistant on a TV show and gradually sort of um, get a look into the writer's room or be able to be a part of a writer's room. But being the writer's assistant, you are sitting in the room with the writers, taking the notes because you know we talk in the room, we just talk all day. It's, I, I sort of compare it to a Thanksgiving table <laughs> dinner. You're just talking and, and so the writer's assistant is really the one that captures all that noise and boils it down so that we know what we talked about the next day. And it is a demanding job and sometimes it helps to have two writer's assistants to sort of switch out because they literally can't even go to the bathroom unless we take a break. They don't want to leave the room because they don't want to miss anything. And um, they don't want somebody to go, what was that one joke that so-and-so pitched about that thing? And it's the writer's assistant's job to like scroll through the notes and say, oh, here's what it is. And so um, it is definitely a very demanding job, but definitely also a good first step to eventually getting on that first job on staff. I've seen a lot of writer's assistants make that step because you are in the room with writers. They do get to know you. Um, Hopefully, you know, if you've written something and most writers will be willing to read your script because they know you have been a good writer's assistant and that you do have ambitions to be a writer. So you're just surrounded by people who want you to succeed. And so it is a very good first step, but also a hard job to just entry level into. Do once, say you make that first step, then what what's the next you mentioned just briefly about having a script should it be a script on the show you've interned or you're working as an assistant on should it be a spec script on whatever um what how and and what do you look at if you were looking for a new writer yes i think when i was coming up people were writing spec scripts back in the day and i don't think which means you're writing a script for an existing series and I really don't think people, showrunners aren't really reading those anymore, but from what I understand, the programs, the fellowships, the Fox, the Disney, um, all of those programs, um, I think they are still requiring or ask for a spec script. But they seem, those seem to be a sort of a dying breed spec script. So most of the things that people write are original materials, an original pilot, half hour, one, one hour, whatever genre you're looking to enter. And usually that's all I read. I have never read a spec script, you know, it just in years for an existing show. I think it couldn't hurt to have one in your arsenal because if you do find a showrunner who says, I wanna see a spec script, but I also wanna see an original pilot, at least you have both. And so I don't think you ever wanna be in the position of saying, oh, I don't have that thing, but I've got this other thing. Um, so I would say have it all, but the focus does tend to be on original material. What if they had a feature script? Does that work well or no? There may be some showrunners who will read your feature script. I'm sure there are, um, but I would say myself, it is so hard to read because you do get a stack of scripts. You just do. And just you're slammed with so many talented writers. And usually you will have somebody reading for you as an interim person, but to get a 190 to 120 page feature script. Now somebody may read the first 30 pages, if you're lucky, <laughs> you know, or the first 10 and go, this is interesting. But I think ultimately they want to see that you know the structure of, of what you're sort of looking to get into what you want to be hired for. So that if you want to be staffed for a one hour drama, 
they want to see, okay, well, they're a good writer, they can write features, they know characters, good dialogue, but do they know the structure of a one hour show? And so typically I think they would, I would prefer to see, oh, they know how to tell a story in a one hour format or a half hour format versus a feature because it's a whole different ball of wax. Um, how is it different for you being a writer on someone else's show and then moving to being a showrunner and also having your own show? Um, I, being a writer on someone else's show is a muscle that is a good training muscle because these aren't your characters. This isn't your world. This isn't your vision. This isn't your tone, but I do. So you are training yourself to sort of speak someone else's language when you're on staff of a show, um, which is also an art form, sort of learning the parameters of what your showrunner likes and what your showrunner doesn't like. So um, hopefully you have a showrunner who can communicate what that is. And it really is just about finding creativity within that, finding story ideas within that, um, finding nuances and characters and dynamics or jokes within those boundaries. Um, and just really trying to be versed in what your showrunner wants and you will be successful in just listening to what they want and what they don't like. And I think if you can quickly learn somebody else's sensibilities, you'll do great, you know, on staff. And I think the, diff the big difference is when it's your show, then, you know, you are the person setting the tone and the characters and saying what you like and what you don't like. It's your world, it's your vision, it's your characters. And now you are in the position of trying to communicate that to a staff who, is, who you have hired to help you execute that. Um, and I think so, <clears throat> excuse me, you just have to be very clear about when you're in that seat of the showrunner, what you want, because I've been in situations where you have a showrunner who's a little wishy-washy, who's a little unclear, who can't really communicate. And it's not that they're not talented, but sometimes they're very internal, you know, within their head and it's, it's a constant mind reading game. So I think um, that makes a good showrunner when you're able to sort of not just have your vision and your characters and your tone in your head, but communicate it to other people who are there to help you. Um. When you have your own show and you're show running, what are the, can you talk about what that job is? What are the elements to that job? I mentioned it earlier, but I'd like you to tell us. Yes. And so um, <clears throat> getting your own show part, getting to that process is, you know, pitching the show. So if you have an idea for a show, the, who are the characters? What, what are some of the stories? What is the tone of the show? based on other stuff that's out there um, and you will pitch it and hopefully somebody will buy it. And um, when they buy it, depending on where you are, some people are lucky enough to get picked up to series directly and suddenly they're given a writer's room and they're off to the races um, with their vision, with a group of people who are going to help them do that. But more often than not, and has been my experience is you pitch it and they go, great, we love it. So now you have to write the script because it's just a pitch. There's nothing on paper. Um, you, I have pitched the pilot story about loosely what I think the first you know, script is going to look like, but it can change and there's things, oh, we love this, don't like that. So then you're into the development process to write the pilot script with a bunch of um, different people who are paying you to do so, which means they are giving you opinions and notes along the way. So you will usually write an outline of what your pitch was. Here's what the pilot story is going to look like. You'll get notes and then they'll, when they're comfortable and everybody likes it, off to script you go. And then you write the script, which hopefully looks very close to the outline. Um, and then you turn that back in to those same group of people Lots of notes, back and forth, back and forth. If there's a studio involved, they're the first line of here is our notes. And then eventually you'll do those notes and then it'll go to the network. And it's a whole different group of people who are also uh, giving notes. Hopefully they are in line and not um, the opposite of what the notes you've already been given by the studio, which sometimes it is. So it really does become uh, a management process at that point as a showrunner of just trying to manage all the notes, not necessarily please everybody, but figure out which notes work for you, trying to figure out, well, what is the note behind the note? 
because sometimes they will try to fix things in ways that don't really aren't really great. So really just trying to understand the note, process it and do what works for you, but still keep your vision intact. And that's just the development process. And if you get through that process and you turn in your pilot, you've done all the notes as best as you see fit, then it's you wait to see, uh, hear the next step, which is where I am now, is great, we love it, we wanna shoot the pilot, um, in which case then you are given a casting director and all sorts of people that will then help you create this pilot, a director, and then you will shoot it, hire your cast and you will shoot it. And so that's what I that's where I am now in my process, getting ready to um, go to New York to shoot it. And then if that process goes well, then, and they like what they see, then you get the series order pickup. Um, and then now you are a showrunner and now you are hiring writers and you are starting a writer's room and writing the rest of the scripts and uh, you're on the air, hopefully for many seasons to come. Um, part of the showrunner job is also overseeing the directing and the editing. How much of that do you do and how much do you, of that do you like? Yes. Um, I do like that. I think, you know, television is a very collaborative process. So if you do not enjoy the collaboration and um, having other people's opinions <laughs> taken into consideration, <laughs> it's probably not the best place for you. But I think when you have a director who um, appreciates that, then I think it's, it's a good um, process because ultimately as the showrunner, it still is your vision and they should be there to execute your vision. I think uh, sometimes directors are coming from fe the feature world in particular, where they are used to kind of being the lone soldier and kind of the leader of the ship in making the decisions. And so it's hard for that kind of person to then step back in TV and realize, oh, it's the showrunner and the executive producer who is actually making the decisions and I should be here to facilitate that vision. But when you do have somebody who is collaborative, I just like to collaborate people who are going to take the script, my part, <laughs> to the next level. And if you have a director that can sort of work with you and see the vision and then take it to the next level, it's great. And same with the editor um, that can show you things that you didn't see or just give you a little something extra. Same with the cast, you know, everybody should be additive to the process. And that's when I, I do enjoy that. So you, I think you're talking about your new show, which has been picked up, uh, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. So are you leaving Good Girls to do that or are you staying on both? Um, I worked on Good Girls as long as it made sense. And then at some point you're just taking too many meetings and out of the room too much that you have to sort of say goodbye to the one thing and transition into the next. And um, hopefully you have a showrunner who's supportive and my showrunner, Jenna Bands is extremely supportive. She did it herself. She started off in Shondaland and eventually got to the point where she was creating her own show. And you balance both as long as you can. And then you eventually transition over into full time on the pilot, which is where I am now. Um, and, and who knows, last year I was in the same position and she said, I hope it goes well and we never see you again, but if, if it doesn't go well, you come back, you'll come back. And I said, okay, we'll see. And then of course the pandemic hit, so it did not go well. And so I went back to Good Girls for this season. And so now same position where um, we're sort of, we're not done, but we're kind of in a good place where I could leave and step away and transition to the pilot full time and we'll see what happens. <laughs> so you talked a little bit about how you sold this show is but you we in the in the world out there you hear that you have to have a pilot script you have to have a pitch deck you have to have a bible how much of that is necessary do you need all three things or can you sell a show i mean obviously you're extremely established but say someone who's newer to the, the process do they need all three things or the, can they sell on one of those right I find with, um, and it's ever changing, it depends on who you're pitching to, but I have never created a Bible for anything just because it's hard. Um, your series is going to evolve. You don't know exactly. You can sort of uh, project, this is what I would love to happen in the first season and, um, you know, and have a Bible of all of 12, 13 different episodes, but you, that process is gonna be a, an 
evolving process. And it's going to involve so many voices, all those executives along the way that I spoke about at the studio and all those executives at the network. Everyone's going to have an opinions. I think it's good to have a vision for where you would like it to go. And when I have pitched a show, I will pitch the characters. I will pitch um, the, the pilot episode. And specifically for streaming, they a little more would like to hear, well, what other episodes? Where else, you know, what do you see season two being? Just sort of as an overall arc, loosely. Not what's episode one, two, three, four, five, six. And I've seen some people put a Bible together and it's very impressive for like 13 episodes for three seasons and um, never done that. And I think that is, it's never wasted work because it's good to have a vision of where you would like to go. But I don't know that anybody that will change. And I don't know that anybody will ever ask you to present that or have it. I think the most that I would present for the show that I am trying to get on the air now is a sort of a series, a series one or a season one series doc, which would just talk about where, well, where do you see all of the characters that are in the series? Where do you see them going over season one um, for each character? but I haven't done that yet. I have not pitched that yet. It wasn't part of selling the show. I've loosely talked about, I think this dynamic would be interesting to explore with these two characters over the season. I think this character might get into this sort of shenanigans over the season or, you know, the mom is probably, would be interesting for the mom to get sick and see how the family deals with that over the season. So when you're pitching something, you can sort of loosely talk about directions that seem interesting, that help people see the series and go oh, that's interesting yeah I would like to explore that and I could see how you could use those characters that you pitched to us to sort of talk about that so I think if you can help them see sort of broad strokes that definitely helps but I've never done like a bible or anything you mentioned that you get a lot of scripts where are those scripts coming from from agents so usually um many times unsolicited, but, you know, they get all of the open assignments open, you know, they have clients that need to be staffed. So they know as soon as a series um, or a pilot gets picked up and, and especially when it gets a series order, but even when the pilot got announced in the trades, suddenly agents, you know, are saying, oh, you know, okay, I, I think I, they've got the script. Most of the times at that point, the script is public domain for, for agents anyway. And they will have five or six clients, three to four clients that they feel would be right for your show based on the script, based on, and they know if in success, this you, you get a series that I would be looking for writers. So usually it's the agents that are sending you their client scripts. If someone doesn't have an agent, it is it seems like they would need to be in a position where they're a writer's assistant or they're working somehow on the show to get a script to you. Or um, would do you read scripts from USC students since you went there? <laughs> right. Not for staffing. Like usually staffing would come in through um, some sort of representation, but I would read scripts from a student who, for example, my assistant, who I don't even know if she's here today on this call, but I read her script before I hired her because I want, I would love to hire people who want to be writers because in success, I want to help those people become what they want to become. And so I will read a script from a student, even for a PA job, if that's what they want to do, or for a writer's assistant position. I want, if that's what you want to do, I would love to have aspiring writers on the staff, even if they are not in the room as writers yet, because the idea is for them to be there, for them to learn the process, for them to meet other writers, for them to be exposed to it, um, so that in success, those will be the people who are gonna be the next staff writers on the show. So I would read scripts for those kind of positions for sure. Can you talk just briefly about the atmosphere and the style of what a writer's room is? I think there's a lot of people here that have no idea what that is. Sure, and I think it's different depending on the genre because I started off in half hour um, comedy, a multi-camera comedy, and the, the writer's room um, was definitely a different experience. Obviously different show to show, but um, long hours, very ruckus. It tended to be male dominated. It tended to be um, white male dominated. 
It tended to be a, a lot of comedians in the, in the room um, who um, like to talk a lot. And it was great because you need comedians on a comedy, but uh, doing that for so long, um, unless that's sort of like your thing, it can be grueling. It can be grueling because long hours and half hour um, multi-camera for sure, which tend to be less and less these days of those kinds of opportunities. But because the process lends itself to a lot of rewriting, um, because you do go to rehearsals um, producer rehearsals, network rehearsals, and then you come back to the writer's room and you rewrite and you basically start at page one. Well, that joke on page three didn't work. How can we come up with something better? This story doesn't work. How can we come up with something better? And that's when you hear those stories of um, the writer's rooms being there till two, three in the morning and working on weekends. And I've definitely been on those kinds of shows. And I would say the transition into the one hour world has been very refreshing because there isn't a lot of rewriting. There's minimal rewriting um, because it, the process just doesn't lend itself to that. So usually we will have a table read. The actors may have some opinions or questions about things or you'll hear something that doesn't work and there may be a few tweaks and changes. But um, at that point, everybody you know, is in the boat and rowing on that episode and there's not a lot of broad changes. And so it wasn't until I got into one hour drama that I actually had a, um, an end time to the day. And my first one hour drama, the showrunner said, so we're gonna, we finish at six every day. And I looked at him like, I don't understand what that means. <laughs> he said, we finish at six, we wrap it up at six and we go home. And I had just never experienced that before. And I, in the past, I had always told my husband and told my kids, I'll see you when I see you. I don't know. You don't know what the day is going to be because when you go to those rehearsals and you come back to the writer's room in a half hour world, you're there until you're done because a new script has to go out that night or in the morning because an audience is loading in on Friday. So the time you just keep writing until you're done. And depending on how your showrunner feels the rehearsal went, it could be a page one rewrite in the room, everybody together, or it could be a few scenes, everybody in the room together, but you just keep working until you're done and you order dinner and you keep working until you're done. And then whenever that happens, then you go home. But there was never a six o'clock, we're out of here. And so uh, I enjoy the six o'clock, we're out of here so much based on my previous experience. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about how you divide up the work? Um, you talked, it sounds like in, in half hour, you're all writing together, but yet you do have specific episodes that are yours or the other, another writers. In one hour, it's an individual, but can you just talk a little bit about how you divide that up? Like who gets what episode and then how you uh, assist them on that. Yes. And again, it's different because your showrunner likes, depends on how your showrunner likes to work and what they prefer. Um, but I've been on shows where in specifically half hour where they go, okay, they have on the board episode one through 10 and you, your name is next to episode five, just sort of randomly because it cycles through all the writers on staff and you got number five and you might get another one. You know, if you're lucky, you'll also get another one, number eight. So you know um, when, it, when your episode is coming up. So when in the room, um, depending on how much you know about that episode, then everyone starts talking about episode number five and you know that your name is on it. So you're listening a little more, but everybody's contributing thoughts and ideas and jokes um, and even structure how, the, how it's gonna be laid out. So when you do go away and write that episode, hope, hopefully you've got your notes You've got the writer's assistant notes because they've been taking good notes while everybody's been talking and you go away with all of that and come up with an outline. Um, and once you have your outline, you bring that back to the room and everybody reads that and then weighs in about what works, what doesn't work, change this, change that, don't love this. And again, hopefully it's additive, <laughs> but ultimately your showrunner is the one who sanctions the changes. And then once you're good with that, you go, you kind of disappear for a couple of weeks or however much time your show has given you to write a first draft um, and you write it. And then you bring that to the writer's room and then everybody um, 
at least in the half hour, they would throw it up on a screen, a big monitor in the room, and everybody's got a copy of your script in front of them. And those are always very stressful days because you have to have thick skin with everybody weighing in on every word, every punctuation, everything that you've written. And in a half hour space, it's it was all about the jokes, the jokes, the jokes. So people will pitch on different jokes and always your favorite joke would disappear. A joke that you've spent 30 minutes crafting will be gone just like that. Maybe in place of a better joke, maybe not, but you sit there and go through that process, but the room is really um, there to hopefully make your script better. Um, and in the one hour space, um, it's specifically on good girls and not all one hours uh, act like this. We do have a room, but we all write the script together. Um, so your name gets picked out of a hat. This is your episode number five, but everybody sort of, um, just gang writes the script. So we break it together. Everybody writes certain scenes. It comes back together in what we call this Frankenstein script to the original writer. And usually the writer will then try to massage it, make it sound like one voice <laughs> and sort of, you know, make it tight. And then it goes to the showrunner. And then ultimately the showrunner, it's in the showrunner's hands to do whatever she or he wants with it. Right. I'm going to open it up for questions in about one minute. I okay. did want to just ask, um, what do you look for in a first, someone new, someone just out of school, what would you look for in that person if you were going to hire them? And then one question was, um, are there, do you only hire people through recommendations or are there websites that post jobs? And anyway, that's, yeah. that's the two part question. Okay. Um, well, I guess, what do I look for? I think I do look for a script. If you wanna be in TV writing, I hope to hire TV writers, <laughs> that potential TV writers. So I do like to see a script um, if that's what you wanna do. So I wouldn't read a script and then also recommendations from other people that you feel can speak to your talent and to your um, abilities and to your responsibility. And that's, and then an interview. And just to sort of talk about what the interests are and what you what, what do you want to do and um, you know why why do you want this job just basic interview experience and in, in terms of looking for people I usually just talk to friends or you know talk to other writers I talk to writers assistants so if you know writers assistants then they do have a huge network out there and I think there's a Facebook page I mean those are really the best people to talk to when you're looking to get your first job is who are the writer's assistants out there? <laughs> and who are the PAs out there? Because honestly, when I was looking for an assistant, I went to my PA and I, he's very responsible. He's very, um, I know that he's not gonna send me or recommend to me someone who isn't like him. So it meant a lot for him to say, hey, here's three people. And where he got those three people, I think some of them were, it was a mix of websites, a networking website that he knew of, and also people, friends who were just out of work who had been PAs on other show. And, and he said, here's five resumes. You know, if you want to meet with them, I'll help you meet them or set them up. Um, so I think that's how a lot of people get their first jobs is through connections with P other PAs and other writers assistants. And I know people like to go straight to the top and say, let me meet us, let me meet the executive producer, let me meet the showrunner. Um, but PAs and writers assistants are always my first stop. Who else do you know that's good and that's that's available right now? <laughs> so one other question and then Charlotte, I'll uh, go to you. Um, how do you, question is, what is the best place to find an agent? How do you know if they're good? Good question. I honestly, agents will come find you if you, <laughs> when you, I didn't have an agent until I got my first job. I mean, I, I graduated from USC. I went through the Warner Brothers workshop and one of my teachers at USC was an old school writer from like the Jeffersons and all in the family and I said, do you know an agent? And he said, my neighbor works at ICM. I'll give you her, I'll give her your script. And he did. And she was like, this is good, but it's staffing season and we're not hiring new writers right now. So thank you. And I was like, okay. But I went through that Warner Brothers workshop and then Yvette Bowser put me on staff. And then suddenly that same agent called me back. <laughs> 
and said, so that thing I said about like not being able to represent you, we would love to represent you um, because I now had a job. And I find that that's the story more than not, that a lot of people get that first job through networking and hustle. And then through that, they get an agent. Um, and if you know uh, other writers who have an agent and, and you feel like your script is ready, which is very important that your script is ready to be seen by that agent, you can always ask that writer, hey, if your agent is looking for new writers, baby writers, staff writers, because they are, because they've got to feed the machine. And every year, you know, series are being picked up, picked up, and they need new writers. And if you feel like your script is great, um, you can get writers to get your script in the hands of an agent um, and see if it works out that way too. Okay, so I have some uh, raised hands. I'm going to go in order. And if you, if there's anyone else, you certainly welcome to raise your hand. So Charlotte, you were the first one. So go ahead and ask your question. Make sure you unmute because you are muted. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Thanks for your time. Uh, my question is, outside of the creative path, meaning a writer or director or cinematographer, if you want to transition, currently I'm a project manager, if I want to transition from project management to production, so that's more of the um, executive uh, uh, logistics path, what would you recommend? Now, what kind of job in production specifically are you, are you considering or would you like? Um, I would love to be a, start out as a line producer. I mean, that's sort of middle level. I did do production assisting through college, but it didn't really lead anywhere. And I went back to school, got a business degree, started project management. So now I'm still really wanting to be uh, in a position where I'm supporting creatives and film industry because I love it. I love film just as a, as a viewer. And I just want to support that industry somehow. Yeah. I think, I mean, line producer is a very big coveted job and a lot of work, but, and the line producers um, have a lot of people under them. And I would say a line producer, those are great relationships to have for what you're talking about, but for other people too, even in terms of PAs, I mentioned writer's assistants and PAs, but the line producers are the ones that get the resumes. Um, and if you feel like there's a job on whatever they're line producing, a TV show, a feature, getting your resume and getting in front of those kinds of people because they have to crew up quickly, um, specifically as it relates to P PA positions, um, they've got to crew up very quickly. And so they're looking at resumes to, um, to hire people. And I would think a line producer would be a good first stop for you to try to meet them and um, get your resume in front of them or get a quick meet and greet with them, even if it's a 10 minute Zoom in this case, just so they know who you are and what you wanna do because they do remember you, they do remember you, um, especially when there's opportunities. Okay, hey, thank you very much. Paige, you're next, don't forget to unmute. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Um, thanks so much for coming today. It's been awesome hearing about your experience. My question might be a little bit different than a typical question you'd get, um, but I'm currently writing an opinion piece for SMC's newspaper, The Corsair, um, about the term or the trope girl boss. And I thought you would be the perfect person to kind of weigh in on this in terms of yourself and your career path, as well as themes seen in Good Girls. And I was just gonna ask you, um, do you think that the term girl boss upholds like a gender stereotype? Since we don't hear the term, you know, boy boss when describing male success and power in the workplace. Oh, that's interesting. I never thought about it, but you're right. We don't hear the term boy boss. So I'm not even sure where the, um, the term girl boss came from and I've never ever spoken that word. So I would agree with you that why not just boss? Why is it boy boss, girl boss? I don't even know what it means actually. Well, I think it's kind of, you know, speaking on how women are seen as an exception or an anomaly in um, higher up successful positions. I mean, such as yourself. 
um, you know, how you got to where you are. And I was just wondering if you personally thought, you know, that kind of trope, even in characters like, say, Beth in Good Girls, you know, how she takes over her husband's business and she's projected as this powerful woman in the industry now. Like, um, I've just seen a lot of media call it a girl boss moment. And um, I was just curious if you had an opinion on that label or not. Right. That's interesting. Well, I don't love it after hearing everything you just said, I would say <laughs> she's just a boss. I mean, I've heard the term boss bitch, <laughs> but I, she's just a boss. Why not just a boss? Cause that's who, that's who Beth is. Um, and that's, you know, that's who we all can be. It's just, you're a boss, you're a boss. So I'm not sure why the gender connotation attached to that, but um, I don't love it. Okay, thank you. Okay, Kayluan. Hello. Hi. Hi, my name is actually pronounced Haluna. It's nice okay. to meet everyone. Nice to meet you, Carla. Nice to meet so, you. So I have kind of a like two-part question. So I'm actually an actor who's been pursuing acting for a while and recently I have started writing and I wrote up a comedy pilot that I'm working on also because I'm taking a screenwriting class at SMC. Hey. Um, yeah, super excited about that. Um, and I actually got a temp gig where I'm temping for a development exec over at Fox. And I'm already kind of learning a lot um, about the process on their end. Mm -hmm. And it seems like a lot of work still, even when you're a successful writer to have your agents pitch you to the networks for these staff positions and things like that. Um, so one question um, I guess would be in regards to this, how would you kind of try to keep this um, network of somebody that you've worked with um, in a temp assistant position to eventually try to pitch to them down the line? <laughs> of yeah. course, not right now, because that would be really unprofessional. But, yeah. um, and then in terms of also a lot of feedback I see on the end of the network is, and the studio is like, um, oh no, this script is like amazing. It's great, but it's it's not for Fox. It's, it's not kind of um, a fit for us. And then the devil's advocate to that, I've heard some people be like, well, why not? We should think outside the box and things like that. <laughs> and as a writer, when you're pitching with your team to networks and things like that, um, do you, what is your process of going through thinking, like targeting what networks you think that you'd be a fit for or that they might be susceptible to working with you? Right. That, those are two good questions. So I think your first question then was um, how to stay in touch with the people for further down the line. That yeah. Work. Um, and I think, you know, they've met you, which is great. And I'm sure they think that you're lovely and your personality. So I think making it known um, that, hey, this is what I'm interested in doing. I've really enjoyed working here, whether you're leaving or not, here's my resume. I would love to be kept for you to keep me in mind for these kinds of positions, um, if anything comes up. I think being able to be specific about what you want to do helps people help you. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I think um, I always appreciate somebody saying, hey, can I send you my resume? And then you, you have their email. I think it's okay to check in from time to time and just say, hey, remember me? I was the intern, whatever. I, I tempt for mm -hmm. you. Um, just checking in if you know I'm, I'm looking. I'm you know I'm not working right now. These are the kinds of things I'm looking for. Keep me in mind, and that works. And people you know will do that or pass me on to other people and keep me keep me in mind. So I think being mm -hmm. able to find that balance of not being too pushy and aggressive, but being assertive and making it know what you're looking for. That's how people find jobs. So um, definitely okay. that. Okay. Definitely, I'd love. Uh, that's a great advice. To kind of ask first, like, can I send you my resume? I do this and I do that. Because yeah. I was also, I've been in these team meetings where casting is in on them too. And I, I, in my head, I'm just like, oh my God, this is so cool. Like I'm on the other end when I'm reading and self-taping. And now I'm like kind of hearing once they get those self-tapes, what they think and talk out about those things. It's really yeah. a really cool experience. Yeah, I'm um, sure that's a whole I, different like, interesting perspective <laughs> want to find the good place to email and timing to email him and say hey guess what I'm actually an actor also if you uh ever want to like just send my headshot to your casting department if I'm ever fit to read for anything <laughs> absolutely okay. absolutely so Kayla did Thank you, you have something 
Kayla, you've been waiting patiently. <laughs> yes, I have. Hi, my name is Kayla and Jerry, and Hi, I'm Kayla. an actress as well. Um, I had a question. Um, it's kind of just like silly, I guess. But what films do you watch and what films do you like to produce and or write? And then also a little, I'm going to take, um, I'm sorry, pronounce your name, Kalina? Haluna. Haluna. Wow. Haluna. <laughs> okay. About that, because I do know a showrunner as well. And I was wondering, how do I check up? Like, just not saying happy holidays and just also be like, hey, I'm an actor. We talked in the past, um, but not be too pushy because everyone wants something. Yeah. So, those are my so first okay. question, what films do you watch and like to write? Okay. Well, um, let's see. Well, mostly TV. I feel like I've watched more TV than films. Mm -hmm. So, and I tend to try to watch, I don't know, I watch a little bit of everything. I watch a little bit of everything. And so um, I'm trying to think the last thing I watched, the show called uh, Dr. Foster on Netflix. I tend to mm -hmm. like stuff that has to do with strong female leads um, and just sort of in interesting situations. So I feel like that was the last thing that I watched that I really liked. Um, mm -hmm. I also tend to like heisty kinds of things and just any kind of sh TV shows that lend themselves to that and probably because of the good girls, you know, in me where we're always looking for heist stories or um, sort of just regular people in heightened positions. <laughs> and so I tend to sort of like those kinds of things when I'm just surfing around too. Um, and then I just finished watching Ginny and Georgia on Netflix because it was sort of this coming of age story that people were talking about. So um, I feel like I'm any character -y stuff. I love family dynamics. I love parent, like mother, daughter, father, daughter kind of stuff um, tends to be what I'm, I gravitate to, but I'm all over the map. So yeah. And then the second part of the question, which is you same similar advice. Mm -hmm. reaching out and saying hey um if it's not even if it's not the showrunner or reaching out to the showrunner to say who's the casting director for the show I would love to be able to reach out to the casting director on your show because every show has a casting director and and submit my stuff so if there's a part that comes up that you feel that I'm right for I would love for you to keep me in mind and so right. I think that that doesn't that never hurts yeah. So Sam and then Adrian and then Cheyenne and then Thank there's a so question. Much, Thank you, Kayla. Hi, <laughs> Carla. I'm Sam Silananda. Hi, Sam. Thank you for coming today, and it's nice to meet you. You too. I'm actually a communications major, but one of my best friends, his mom is a TV producer, and he tells me that that's that kind of job is very stressful and busy. But you seem to enjoy it, so I'd like <laughs> to know how it really feels to be doing that job. <laughs> It is very stressful and it is very busy. And sometimes I'm like, what have I gotten into? So it is very stressful because there are so many different moving pieces. And I have to say, even with this pilot, every day I wake up scared to death about what is going to go wrong today. Because I feel like it's a train that you're trying to keep on the tracks. And at any moment, it could just sort of fall, go this way. And you're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> but I wake up, it, there's just decisions that meet, need to be made and so many different moving pieces that I feel like will just take the whole, just crash the whole thing down. So I think um, it is stressful, but it's also just, you know, I'm very thankful. I feel very blessed to be able to do this as well because it's what I came out here to do. These, I want to tell stories. I want to, these are characters that I want to see on TV. So I think all the stress, stress is sort of at the end of the day worth it when you're doing something, whatever that is that you love. So I see. And I hear also that you, that people like you are considered celebrities because I, I know people say, oh, your friend's mom is a, a TV producer. She must be a celebrity. But when I looked her up, I, she's not like that popular. No. Not at all. I don't feel like writers, maybe people like Shonda Rhimes and Kenya Barris. And I right. feel like some people definitely get to that celebrity status. I am not that person. And I, I find more often than not, nobody cares about the writers, really. They want to meet the actors. They want to meet the people in front of the camera, the beautiful people. They are definitely the uh, the celebrities, and I'm okay with that. And I'm okay with that. <laughs> but you um, look great. I think so uh, Sam, people want to meet on. you too. You look great. And There's Paul, nothing. Sam, we yeah. need to move on. Thank Shen you, Paul. Sam. Okay. You're welcome. Tell you've had your hand up for a while. 
Chantel? Okay, uh, I'm gonna go. Thank you so much everyone. Um, and thank you so much for being a part of this, uh, this discussion. I think it's a very important discussion in terms of writing. I do have a couple of quick questions because in the process of being on something that's a little bit more long-term versus being an hour and like even 30 minutes, um, how does that get processed through or is it better if you're about to pitch something, it's kind of like a double question um, to make sure that it's enlisted first through like the Writers Guild first or in the processing of creating a show, is it kind of like everything just comes together and is already protected because you're underneath um, a particular like, you know, Fox or Warner Brothers or, or stuff like that. Like, how do you go about, I guess, protecting the writing and um, right. that process? Right. I think it's more important for new writers who don't have an agent to, you know, protect themselves. And I think you can still register your script with the Writers Guild, which just says this writer submitted this idea on this date. <laughs> you know, so you kind of have confirmation that it's your idea. And I think it's just helpful when you don't have sort of the, you know, any protections around you or an agent or anything like that. And because some writers are scared to talk about that, their idea because of that, they're fearful that I, someone's going to steal it. But you do, in order to sell it, you have to talk about it and you have to be passionate about it. But I would say just, um, you know, protect yourself as much as possible because so many ideas are very similar as well. So it doesn't mean that somebody has stolen your idea, but um, don't ever be afraid to pitch it and talk about it and share your enthusiasm about an idea. But I think registering your script with the Writers Guild is always a good way to go. Okay, Adrian. Yes, okay, hi, my lighting is really bad, so I apologize. Carla, thank you so much for being here. This is such a great discussion. Great. Um, so I have a quick question. So when pitching a script, you know, the writer's assistants and the agents, you were talking about how they have to go through hundreds of pages to read. Is Would it be better to have maybe a pitch slide deck with maybe 10 slides and a sizzle reel to, to give them versus the script? And if they want the script, they can come or ask for it or, you know, find out more about it. In for writing purposes? Yes. No, because I think at the end of the day, they want to see the format that they're going to hire you for. So okay. I think if you have something addition to add to the script, you know, that you're like, oh, and I've got this thing, I've got this pitch deck, or here's the look of the show. That's always fun. But I think at the end of the day, they're hiring you to be a writer and write words in the format of the script, you know, that they're that, for that job. So I think they will always read a good writer and I am always looking for good writing. Like when I open a script, I want it to be great. So I'm not deterred by, oh, I got to read another one. I got to read another one. I mean, it is a lot of reading. And sometimes you really can tell within the first 10 pages if you're going to go on or not, or if you're going to set that one aside and go to somebody else. So I would say, yes, people will read your script. So write the script. If, you know. Okay. Yeah. And is there a difference between TV script and a movie script? Yes, and there's a difference between half hour multi camera scripts and um, single camera half hour scripts, one hour drama. They each have their own format. Okay. okay. So I'm jump in. And also, just one last thing, one last yeah, thing. Carla, can I follow you? Would you mind if I connect with you on LinkedIn? Oh, yeah, no problem. Thank you. Okay, Cheyenne, then Linda, and hopefully we can get to you, Roberta. Okay, Cheyenne. Hey, okay, hello, my name is Cheyenne Wilkins. Um, I do have, oh, and thank you for being here, right? And um, I do have this one question. So uh, did going to USC and, oh wait, you did get a degree, right? For screenwriting at USC, okay. Did getting that degree help aid in your career like when you first started or was it like the opportunities that came with going to the school in general? Definitely the opportunities that came with going to the school in general. Nobody cared. Nobody asked. Nobody said, ooh, MFA from USC. Ooh. <laughs> nobody was impressed. Nobody cared about that. <laughs> so it was definitely a chance for me to spend those two years doing nothing but writing, learning the craft of writing, learning the formats, meeting people, networking, getting internships. Those were the things that helped me be successful. And it was very expensive to go to graduate school. So I, you know, if you can afford it, great. Um, but there are definitely other means to uh, breaking in that to give you all those things. 
Okay. Okay, thank you. Lynn, go ahead. Hi, thanks so much for being here. Um, so I just had a small question. Um, as like, I'm, I'm a black woman, you know, in trying to get into the industry um, it, as a cinematographer, you know, trying to be aspiring. Have you found anything like barriers within the industry for, you know, women of color that you've had to like overcome or anything like that? Because I'm finding a lot of, you know, pushback from people inside and outside of the industry, just telling me that my voice isn't really wanted. Oh, well, that's horrible. I don't know who would say that. <laughs> but, you know, I think as with everything with, you know, for us, it's just a little harder, you know, and I think lately with everything that's gone on in the country, people are sort of waking up to how people of color have been absent from these opportunities and how our voices have not been a part of the narrative, but also how important it is that we should be. So I think now more than ever, people are starting to be, people are checking for black people is what I always say, <laughs> but people are really starting to go, oh, wow, we value that voice. We are missing that voice. We need that point of view. That's so important and shame on us. And I feel like that's happening more and more. Um, and I hope that it, that just never goes away because you know there's so many voices, there's so many stories to tell, there's so many points of view. So we need everybody in that mix. And so I hope that continues. The last question is in the uh, in the chat. Um, how difficult is it to transition from one format as a writer? For instance, if you were in a head writer in animation, would it be good for you to take a step down and take a, a, a staff writing job an hour long, or is that even possible? Gotcha. Well, I made that transition and it wasn't easy. And it's funny because I did a whole other Zoom with the TV Academy about making the transition to different things and how hard it is. Because when you do something for so long, people do tend to pigeonhole you. Um, and I think Roxanne, that's probably where I met you <laughs> was in that, <laughs> in that TV Academy session. But people do tend to want to pigeonhole you into one thing. So for me, it was half hour television. And so trying to make that transition after doing that for 16, 17 years to do one hour, it took some time. And I even told my agent, I will take a step down to get in to move into it if that's what it takes and just work my way up. And it turned out that I didn't have to do that. I made sort of a lateral move and then kept going. Um, but you may have to be willing to do that to, um, to sort of transition into something that you've never done before or haven't proven yourself um, capable of doing yet. It doesn't mean that you can't do it, but Sometimes people just can't see beyond, oh, well, they've only done that. So how, how are they capable to do this one thing? And for me, making the transition from half hour to one hour, which I talked about in that Zoom, was doing a script, an original um, script. I wrote two of them. I wrote a half hour version of it. And then I wrote a one hour version of it. And I told my agent, because every year you go out with me and try to sell me as a half hour writer, I said, Go ahead and do that because that's easy for you, but also try to push me to some one hour shows as well. And here's the script to do that. Um, and that was the thing that ultimately helped me transition. So you might have to be creative and find different ways that people can um, see you differently um, to make that transition. Well, Carla, we can't thank you enough. I mean, we've taken quite a bit of your time, but you've asked, answered a lot of our questions. Oh, great. You've it's been great. Been so generous in yeah. um, giving us all your information and about your life. So I really, really appreciate it. And you had a huge group here that was all excited to hear you and about your career path too. So Again, thank Great. you very much. Thank you to everyone who joined us, who wasn't in this particular class, but also joined us from the school. So um, thank you for having me. This was great. I enjoyed it. Thank you for all the great questions. It was great seeing and meeting everybody. Thank you. And good luck with your new show. Thank you. Fingers crossed. We'll be watching. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> thank, thank you, you everybody. Good luck. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Captor? Yes. Will this be sent to us and how long will it take to send to us? You mean the recording? Yeah, the recording. Um, I had, I did, I didn't start right away, but I did start oh, yeah. when, she, when Carla came in. It was the beginning mm -hmm. part. 
I got it. So um, I will send it to the ambassador group and they can send it out. Okay, thank you. Hi, Professor. Yes. I had a question. I didn't see you on the business or the teaching business or theater classes. I, I came in through uh, Professor Adelman and his. Okay. So what can you.